Hi, thanks for joining us today. If this ministry has impacted your life, we want to hear about it. You can send us your story at amen at vnchurch.com. Also, we would love if you would partner with us financially. You can go to vnchurch.com and click the Give Online or text your donation amount to 757-230-2110. To honor copyright laws, we have removed some audio and video elements from this message. Now here's this week's message. My name is Lisa. And I'm Roniel. We've been attending Vineyard for a little over a year. After a few months, we decided to join. Around the same time, there was an emphasis on small groups. And we handed in a form and expressed our interest in joining a group. Initially, I received an email from Pastor Samuel suggesting a group based on our location and including a list of all the current groups. In that email, he said that he would be happy to talk with us about anything specific that we needed to know about the groups. Pastor Samuel listened to me explain where we are in our life and our faith, and he recommended three different groups based on that information. And the very first one that he recommended was the right one for us. The people there are very warm and they treat us like family. Being a part of this group means so much to me. We go through hard times just like anyone else. And there have been times when we went through some tough things and we weren't part of a small group. It is so much easier to handle something like that when you have a group of believers to share with and pray for you. We have a responsibility to the other people in the group to pray for them and support them, but they do the same for us. We feel so much more a part of the church and a part of the group. It's great feeling comfortable enough to open our lives to these people and them do the same thing for us. And then when the weekend service comes along, there's more people you recognize and say hi to. Personally, I think it's important to see how God is working in other people's lives. And we get to see this by talking with others and they can recognize where God is working in our lives. It's interesting to see how much my wife and I learn about each other in responses to other members of the, of the group or by the material that we're reading together. Not only does the material that we discuss in the small group help our faith grow, but just by attending, uh, it shows our kids just how much it means to us to connect with other members of the church. Being in a small group has made us feel more connected to the family of Vineyard, and it also has brought my wife and I closer together. We are really looking forward to the new semester of small groups beginning this week. Well, good morning. If you happen to be here for the first time, let me introduce myself. My name is Andy Mead. I am one of the pastors here, and I'm glad that you're here with us. If you're online with us, we welcome you as well. We are doing a special service today because today is our small group launch weekend. We do this three times a year, and it's significant because we start over. All of our small groups, we just kind of reboot. It's a great time to start and get involved in a small group if you're not in one already. So you'll hear more about that. That's kind of what we're doing today. And uh, I think that you'll be real blessed as uh, God makes some holy connections. I want to tell you about uh, an ascent up a mountain. Now, I've done some mountaineering when I was younger, not in the sterile, safe confines of a rock gym or one of these, uh, these climbing apparatuses, but out in the, in the wild. And it can get pretty dangerous. It can get pretty scary. And uh, sometimes I like to read stories about people that have done great exploits and have had uh, some big challenges that they've had to overcome. I want to tell you about one. It happened on this mountain called K2. K2 is the largest, second largest mountain in the world. Of course, Everest is the large, the tallest, but it's considered one of the most difficult, if not the most difficult, because it has very, very steep sides, and they're all just as long all the way around the mountain. It's very, very treacherous. In fact, up until 1990, 41% of the climbers who attempted to, to, to summit K2 ended up perishing. They died. And so the first expedition happened in 1954. 1954, it was an expedition of nine guys. And they went up this mountain trying to summit it for the very first time. The, one of the guys on this team was, br was brand new to the team. His name was Pete Showing. Pete Showing was the new guy, and he really had very little experience. He had never climbed outside of the United States. 
And even his climbing in the United States was very small, just a little, some, some small climbs. And th to give you context, that would be like taking somebody who just jogged a mile a day and they got sucked in all of a sudden overnight onto the Olympic, Olympic marathon team. I mean, that's the kind of transition it would be. The leader who brought him on said the reason he brought him, even though he was highly inexperienced, was just because he liked his smile and that he was cheerful. That, that was mainly the reason why he brought him on. So they go up this, this they're trying to summit K2. They get close to the top, up near the death zone where there's not enough oxygen to survive, and they had no supplemental oxygen. And they get trapped by a prolonged storm. They're there for four days, and one of the members of the team collapses. He's diagnosed by the doctor who's with him, and he's found out that he has a blood clot in his leg. If it goes to his lungs, he'll probably die. They're not sure what to do. Even with modern gear and, and equipment, it would be almost impossible to get him down in those conditions. And so they just stay there. And they stay there for nine days, nine days trapped. And they realize summoning's no longer an option. It's just now can we get down. They decide to try to bring this guy with them who, is, who is, has this blood clot. So they wrap him in, they put him in a sleeping bag, wrap him in a tent, and then they, bind, they wrap him up in a rope and then they start to belay him down the mountain. Now, this is a particular term called belaying. And so I brought to demonstrate how this works is you have your climbing rope and uh, the harness, in this case, the, that story I'm telling you, he couldn't wear this because he was all in his sleeping bag. But normally you would have this harness on and the thing that pulls it together is a carabiner. Now, there's different types. There's specific ones for different purposes. This is just a double loop going through this carabiner. And this is the thing that holds it all together. Somebody's, when you belay somebody, so make sure it's on the camera. Okay, when you belay somebody, um, you're putting tension on the rope so that if they were to fall, they would not fall very far. If they were to fall into a crevasse, they would not fall plummet to their death. And so as they start to move, you slowly give away the tension so that they can move forward. But you're always there keeping the tension. That's being on belay. And so this guy, Peter Showing, at that moment had this injured guy on belay. And as they're descending, they come across an ice field. Now, you don't have to know a lot about mountaineering, but an ice field sounds kind of treacherous to me. How about you? It's, it's, this is, so they come upon this very steep ice field, and one of the guys loses his, his, his footing. He starts to fall. He falls and grabs two other pairs of rope climbers, and they start to fall. They're descending and accelerating down an ice field at a rapid rate, certain death. And so it's, it's six guys now descending down, and they are stopped because of Peter showing. Peter showing, the new guy, has his ice axe firmly locked into a rock, but here these guys are descending with a rope, and it's over 1,000 pounds of adult male meat and gear, and he's wondering, am I going to be cut in half by the rope? Am I, am I going to be torn in half? And he's already exhausted. He's been up in the death zone for several days in blinding, howling winds. He can't see. His hands are frozen. He's been deprived of oxygen, and he hangs on. And he actually, these guys that are descending at a rapid rate, as they're flailing around, he's wondering, can I do it? Can I do it? He hangs on. And they all are able to get their footing, and those guys don't die because of his willingness to be on belay and then rescue these guys. Today I'm talking about small groups, and I'm calling it on belay because to me, when Jesus decided to set up his movement on earth, he didn't do it by creating an army. He didn't start a corporation. He didn't start a university. He didn't even start a country. Instead, he started a small group. And a small group was 12 guys, in his case, where he got 12 guys together, and he tied them together, and he basically said, you're on belay with me. We're going to rope ourselves together. We're going to do life together. And so we're going to be able to summit things that we couldn't do on our own. And when we hit dangerous Carafes, crevasses and dangerous uh, problems and travails of life, 
We're going to do it together. Solo, you can't necessarily do it together. We have a much better chance. And so this is what Jesus does. He sets up this small group system. And I want you to pull out your outline. Read this first verse with me in Mark. And so we see the simple curriculum that Jesus puts into place. <clears throat> Mark 3 says, And Jesus went up to the mountain and summoned those who he himself wanted, and they came to him. Now look at verse 14 with me. It says, And he appointed twelve, and here's why, so that they would be with him. This, if you're taking notes, underline that. Be with him, and that he could send them out to preach. So it's two parts. We're going to look at that. First, to be with him. Be with him. He has 12 apostles, 12 guys. They become the apostles. And he sets it up so that they would, his plan was let's rope ourselves together. Let's be on belay. Let's, let's be with him. And they do life together. And Jesus wanted to uh, just experience life. If, if, they, if they were going through a difficult time, Jesus was with them. If they were celebrating and having a, the time of their life, Jesus wanted to be with them. They were in an emotional crisis. Jesus wanted to be with them. If they were going through arguing or conflict, he wanted to be there with them. This is the context of a small group, that it's Jesus with us, and we're belayed with him and one to another. Now read with me in the book of Acts. In the book of Acts, you have this small group system that Jesus began, that we read about in the Gospels, and now in Acts, there's a description of a small group, okay? Because they decided after Jesus was ascended to heaven, they said, hey, this was great. We were able to be belayed with Jesus and live with Jesus and, and do life with him. Let's do that again. Let's get our own small groups and we'll be the leaders and we'll do what Jesus did with us. And then we'll ask them all to do the same thing. And this is why small groups are so important. And so here's what it says. It says, all the believers devoted themselves, this is in the early church, to four things. The apostles' teaching, that's basically the New Testament. And to the fellowship, and again, if you're taking notes, circle that word fellowship. And to sharing in meals, that's including the Lord's Supper, and to prayer. Now, fellowship. Fellowship's kind of an odd word. We don't really use that today, right? I mean, how often do you, like, go out, get a drink with somebody, say, hey, let's go fellowship. You say, what? What are you talking about? It doesn't have a lot of context for us today, but in those days, fellowship was a real powerful word. The, the word meant we're going to be very close with one another. We're going to really share our hearts with one another. We're going to be open with one another. We're going to be vulnerable with one another. We're going to, to be able to meet each other's needs. I'm going to give, and I'm also going to receive from you. It was a, it was a powerful word. And, uh, and it says they're devoted. It says they, later on, a few verses down, it says they worshiped together at the temple each day. They met in homes. Now, that's key. They met in homes uh, for the Lord's Supper and shared their meals with great joy and generosity. And so all, these, these, these small groups were on belay. They were little communities meeting together, and they were meeting in homes. And you see this as you start to read uh, the book of Acts, as you see over the next 40 years, uh, the early church, they're always in homes. I mean, at one point you see they're in Mary's home, and then another point you see they're in Priscilla and Aquila's home. Another point it says they're in a guy named Jason's home. Another one, a guy named Narcissus. I guess that's like probably a, a group for egomaniacs, you know, that they're kind of trying to work through that. I don't know. Another one was Philip, and then Lydia, the Philippian jailer, and on and on and on. And we see this, that they're meeting in homes. It wasn't until 300 years later that they started meeting in church buildings. And it's not like the Holy Spirit changed his mind and said, you know what, I'm scrapping the small group idea. Everybody's now going to go to a large building, and now small groups and everything else is optional. No, no, it wasn't optional. That was the church, was in meeting in small groups because it was in those communities that you could be on belay. It was on those communities where you could be roped to one another. You could do life together. And lives change in that context. And a big meeting like this, you can come in, you inspired by a message, some good music, and uh, we, you know, say a couple prayers, and then you go, you, real life change happens in communities that are smaller. That's why it's not like an option, that is where life change happens. 
that is where life change happens. Certainly we use uh, the, uh, the weekend services here at Vineyard to help people discover uh, who they are in Christ, to discover, hey, to make a commitment to Jesus. That's our primary focus of the weekend service, for you to be able to invite people who are still wondering what, where they're at. And they want to hear about the claims of Christ. And they're, they're on the bubble. They haven't made a decision yet. But it's small groups where real life change happens. And here at the Vineyard, we have, we have a lot of small groups. We have a lot of people that are belayed with one another. And they're saying, we're going to do life together. And, uh, and if you're new to Christ, and maybe you've recently come to Christ, your next steps is getting involved in a small group getting involved in a small group. And so that's one of the reasons we do this small group launch weekend because it's a great time to get involved where everything starts over. Everybody's, uh, you know, you're not like dropping into a group that's been meeting for years and they're on, you know, they're deep into some book or something like that. No, everybody's starting over. So how do you know if a group is on belay? Well, there's, there's five things that go into it. Five things for a small group that is on belay where they're committed to summoning the purpose of God's in their life. Number one is, is people are devoted to each other and they will pay a significant price to do life together. They'll pay a price. There is a price to be paid. Verse uh, 42 of Acts 2 says, all the believers devoted themselves to fellowship. And where did they get that idea from? I mean, where did they get the idea, we're going to devote ourselves to this community, to fellowship? Well, they got it from their leader, Jesus. Jesus was, was committed to that. And that in those days, rabbis would never go and ask somebody to be in their group. It just, it was, they saw it as beneath themselves. They just felt like uh, people should come to them. And, and so Jesus didn't do that. If you know his story, he went and he found these guys and he said, come and follow me. I'm inviting you in. To a group. And so they came because they, what a privilege. Could you imagine? They knew, they, they knew that was unheard of. And Jesus, by the way, was a Jewish rabbi, just in case you're wondering. I mean, they, it was unheard of that somebody would do that. And here they're invited in. They didn't have to, they wanted to. It was, it was a privilege. It was an honor. And they got to come and be part of Jesus's small group. Have you ever thought of why he chose those particular 12 guys? I mean, maybe you never thought about it. Just 12 guys. Well, actually, there's, if you look at it, you, you think, well, what does bring those guys together? Were they powerful? No. Were they all wealthy? No. Were they all super intelligent and had good strategic minds? No. In fact, when we start to look at them, we see Peter was incredibly impulsive. We see Judas was greedy and he was a betrayer. Thomas was a doubter. James and John, they were only interested in going up the corporate ladder. And then you have Simon, he was a zealot, which means he hated tax collectors. Also on the team was Matthew, who was a tax collector, which means he hated zealots. <laughs> I mean, he just had, the one question they certainly all had in common was, why did Jesus bring those other guys on this team? I mean, certainly I'm the right guy, but the other guys, they don't make sense. You know, these 12 guys that seem to have so much, you know, not in common. Things that would cause conflict and all these kinds of things. Well, small group experts say that the greatest threat to the success of a functioning on belay small group is, is not that they don't have enough time. Although those kinds of things can be a problem. You know, it's not that, oh, I'm so busy. That certainly can be a problem, but that's not the greatest threat. And it's not something like, Doctrinal disagreements within the group. The number one threat to a strong, powerful, on belay small group is what is known as extra grace required people. EGRs. EGRs. You go, what's an EGR? Well, an EGR, extra, they just need extra grace. Why? Because they tend to, like, talk too much. <laughs> They're always talking about themselves, maybe. Um, they just don't get social cues. Something's missing. They're kind of weird. No, the, the people we see 
in our small groups are not, are kind of like what Jesus had. They're not, you know, all these beautiful, normal, wonderful people. No, they're, they're extra grace required people. And here's what I have discovered over 35 years of ministry. Every small group has at least one EGR. Every small group has one EGR, extra grace required person. And if you're in a small group and you're thinking, you're thinking through your list of everybody in your group, and you're thinking, I wonder who that is. And you don't know? <laughs> it's because you're it. <laughs> I mean, that's just, that's just the way that goes. Now, what's fascinating about Jesus is he, all 12 of his guys were EGRs. They all had the, all of these problems. And you see it as you read the Gospels. They're just, it, you know, it would try anybody's patience, but Jesus is with them through that, working with them, processing with them, and Jesus loves them. And so at the end of the three years when Jesus ascends to heaven, they are changed. Nobody had ever taken the time and loved them like Jesus did. And it just transforms them. And they go, we need to do that. We need to love other people like Jesus loved us, those EGRs. We'll love them all. And their lives will be changed. And then they can go and do that as well. This is the movement that Jesus set up, the small group, small group movement that changes people's lives. Number two, an on belay group is safe. It's a safe place to get real with people. It's a safe place. Acts 2.42, they were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart. Now, if you are taking notes, circle that word sincerity. That's an interesting word. Sincerity in the Latin actually is a combination of two words. Sin is without and seer is wax. It's without wax. And here's how that term was used. Back in the days of the Romans, they loved to collect Greek statues. It was one of their great things that they would do is collect these great statues like the ones you see on the screens. And when they would collect them, a lot of them were old because they were passed down sometimes centuries. And so they had cracks, they had chips. And a art dealer, a statue dealer, to make more money would sometimes take and fill in those holes, those cracks with wax to cover it up. And he did a great job. Sometimes it was really hard to tell. And if you were a purchaser of one of those statues and you got it home only to discover there was wax filling in the cracks, you were disappointed because you always wanted one that was authentic without, all of the, without wax. And so it was, it was stamped sincere if it was without wax. It had like an, an authentication process to it. And now we're told here in the Bible that the small groups that were effective that were on belay were without wax. They were without, they, they, they were without covering up, you know, without pretension. Pretending you're somebody you're not. And we're all pretty good at that. We know how to put on our happy face. You go to, you know, you go to work, you go to church, you go, you put on your face. Hey, I'm doing great. How are you doing? Oh, good. You, and, and, and a small group is supposed to go beyond that. Sincerity, without wax, without the, all that other stuff that often gets kind of overlaid, causes us to get, to get sidetracked. Jesus is the one who really demonstrated that. You see this in Jesus' life. The disciples saw that. He's the one who came up with this idea of sincerity. I mean, Jesus was sad, and he would... He, he wasn't afraid to show his emotions. He'd weep in front of them. When he was joyful, he'd show that. Some, one time he was, he was in such a place of anguish, he actually let them overhear his prayer when he said, my soul is grieved to the point of death. He didn't hide that. That's where he's at in that moment. That's sincerity. You know, there's a fasc fascinating passage that Paul writes in the book, to Corinth, when he talks about this, uh, this person in the Old Testament, Moses. Moses, if you know the story, went up to Mount Sinai, had this encounter with God, comes down, and it's such a powerful encounter, he's like, his face shows it. 
It's like his face is shiny. And we use that term today, right? Somebody's all excited. They're, we just, they're, they're beaming. Their face is beaming. Right? And for a, when, somebody's, when a couple is married, right? they always say on the wedding day, the bride, she looks radiant. They never say that about the groom, right? Nobody gives a rip about the groom. <laughs> Bride's radiant, though, right? So, oh, look, at she's radiant. And so Moses' face was radiant. And he, when he would join his group, everybody would see that. Dang, look at that. Moses has been with God. Whoa, this is insane, man. Where he, look at Moses. He's, he's radiant with, with his devotions and his time with God. He always knows the right verse. Man, you are so close to God. Moses liked that. He's going, yep. Yeah. <laughs> you got that right, man. Me and God were like this. And then one time, what happens is he goes and looks in the mirror, and he sees that shininess starting to fade. And he doesn't like that. And so notice what we're told here. It says, we are not like Moses. He kept covering his face with a veil. He didn't want the people of Israel to see the glory fading away. Well, he wasn't as spiritual as everybody had thought, and he didn't want people to know that. He wanted people to think he was still a spiritual, so he started wearing a veil. Covering up. We're not told how long he wore that veil. We're not even told what caused him to take it off. My guess is it's probably his wife, Sephora. She probably said, Moses, that looks so stupid on you. You're not, you're not, you're not, you're not fooling anybody. Why don't you just take the stupid thing off? And then one day, he showed up at group without his veil. I bet that felt good for him. Just plain old Moses. This is all I am, man. And part of being sincere is just saying, this is me. I mean, it's some good stuff and some failures, some weaknesses, some humanity, things I'm not all that proud about, and we're just vulnerable. We're sincere with one another. That happens in a small group. That doesn't happen here, right? It doesn't happen here. But it happens there, and that's a transformative group. That's a group that's committed to being on belay. Notice, the, we're told here in a few verses later, that because we have God's acceptance and his love, what Jesus has done for us, says all of us reflect the Lord's glory with faces that are not covered with veils. You see, a small group like this is one that honors confidentiality. When somebody shares we're not loose with our, with our tongues. We, we, we recognize. We don't have to have a rule we say every time. Hey, what, what goes on here stays here. No, it's, it goes without saying. That's a group that's on belay. Because we're, we're, we're in this together. And we, we treasure one another. We honor one another. We don't laugh at each other. We laugh with each other, but not at each other. We respect one another. We're real with one another. So we're going to start a series next week called Get Real. Because I think it's important that we learn how to be real with people. And we go through some of the challenges in our relationships. And we, and we get better at that. And we get closer, not farther away and not worse at it. And so I encourage you. We have that flyer we gave you. Don't put that on your refrigerator. Oh, this is a good reminder. You know, give it to somebody. That's what it's for. Give it to somebody who you think could be better in their relationships with the people around them. Invite them as well. Thirdly, an on belay group is, is when it's, place, it's a place where people speak truth to one another. Ephesians 4, verse 15 says, speaking the truth in love. You know, we have a tendency to not always want to hear the truth about ourselves. We can almost deceive ourselves about how good we're doing or how bad we're doing. And there's nothing like other people that can speak into that. And Jesus had that. Because Jesus believed in speaking the truth to one another. It was part of, he bred, bred that into his group. He said, that's what it means to be on belay. We speak the truth. We do it in love. One time, James and John are talking about who's better. You know, who's a better follower of Jesus? Jesus hears this. And he confronts them in his artful way. He confronts them with a question. He says, what were you discussing? This is Jesus to James and John. What were you discussing out on the road? But they didn't answer. Well, of course they didn't answer. You know, it was, could you imagine? They were busted because they had been arguing about which one of them is the greatest. I mean, what kind of argument is that? 
I can deny myself better than you. No, you can't. I can pick up my cross better than you. No, you can't. I mean, wh what? And so Jesus overhears that. He goes, uh, what are you guys talking about? Mm, you know, they're looking down. Nobody wants to own up to it, right? They're kind of embarrassed. But Jesus addresses it. He doesn't just sweep it under the carpet. He goes, no, no, I'm going to, let's, let's, let's go, let's, let's go down this, this thing. Let's talk about it. That's important. When we're discussing stuff, Jesus, he doesn't just say, get out of here. You guys are out of the group. He doesn't say, I'm disgusted with you. No, he, but he doesn't sweep it under the carpet. He doesn't say, oh, gosh, I hear what they're saying. That could pose conflict. I want everybody to like me. So in the name of love, I'll just ignore it. He doesn't do that. Right? He, he, doesn't, he, he doesn't say, oh, I don't want to make waves. I mean, no, he, he presses in, says, I want to do something about this. One time Peter gets off course, and he's kind of two-faced at this point in his life where he's saying one thing to one group and another thing at another group, and Paul gets a wind of this. And so Paul, he confronts him, and Galatians says that he confronts Peter face to face. See, conflict's going to happen, and he confronts him face to face. He doesn't get on social media and rant all about, can you believe what Paul or what Peter did? No, he, he face to face, right? And obviously, he didn't have face, uh, social media then, but he wouldn't have done it. He, he had other options at his disposal. Why? Because when you're devoted in a group, and they were devoted to the apostles' teaching, they're devoted to how do we actually make this happen? It's not just memorizing Bible verses. How do we actually live this stuff out? That's hard to do. How we grow in our character is by letting other people speak into our lives. And in a small group, you kind of, you allow people in. Hey, you can speak into my life. You can speak, do you see something in my character? Do you see something in my marriage? Are you, uh, what about my finances? What about my spiritual growth? What about the way I'm, I'm, I'm raising my kids? I mean, we allow people in when we're on belay because we're, on, we're doing this together. Number four, it's a place where conflict, which is inevitable, leads to reconciliation and growth. Reconciliation and growth. Now, Jesus, he, he had some great disappointments in his hour of need. They're not there. They're, they, they, they run away. You know, here's his little group that he had poured. He was the leader of that group for three years. And when he's arrested and then falsely tried and crucified, his disciples, they flee. Peter one of his close disciples had denied him three times. Just denied him three times. And so if you know the story, after the resurrection, Jesus finds the disciples fishing, and he calls them, Peter comes up, and there we see in this scene where uh, there's a charcoal fire, Jesus has some bread and some fish, and New Testament scholars say that he's recreating the same uh, scene where G when Peter had denied him three times. They say there was a charcoal fire at that time. So he's creating the scene again. And then he asked Peter three times, do you love me? Because Peter had denied him three times. And so three times Peter has to say, I love you. I love you. I love you. And in that, see, there's a restoration that took place. He was restored. He didn't sweep it under the, the rug. He dealt with that conflict. He could have been tempted to say, well, that's, you know, we'll just never talk about that again. No. You talk about it. You work through it. Legend tells us that subsequently, when Peter would be taught, sometimes would be taunted by people, you know, that didn't like him or were just ragging on him. And they would, they would crow like a rooster because they knew Jesus is, what he had said. Here it is here. I wrote it down for you. Peter, let me tell you something. This is Jesus talking to Peter. Before the rooster crows tomorrow morning, you will deny me three times that you even know me. You will deny that you know me even three times. And so it didn't bother Peter, though. They would cr crow like a rooster in his mind. See, if, if Jesus had not dealt with that conflict, there would have always been a little dagger there. Ah, oh, I did do that. But Jesus had gotten it right with him. He dealt with that conflict. And so, no matter what other people said, Peter didn't let that get to him. 
Later on, years later, Peter writes this. He says, to sum it up, all of you be harmonious, sympathetic, brotherly, kind-hearted, and humble in spirit. He says, I've learned the value of being rela belayed relationally when you're hanging over, you know, a scary crevasse when you don't know if the relationship will go, go under. He goes, there's great value in it. And he says, do it. Number five, lastly, it's a group that has a mission beyond themselves. Now, when Jesus, the first verse we looked at, it said that they were, that, that they were, that he was, wanted to be with them. And then he also wanted to send them out. So there's two parts. Could you imagine if after Jesus had left, they said, wow, that was great. Let's just keep it together with us 12. We're not going to do anything else. We had it. Look at how bonded we are. I don't want to like start over and start creating new relationships. We've got this thing going. Let's just stay together, us 12. You know what would have happened if they had done that? I wouldn't be here, nor would you. The reason why the message of Christ has gone out over the years is because those guys decided the way Jesus loved them, they're going to love others and they're going to do it through small groups. And so that they said, let's do this with one another. Let's do this with one another. Now, certainly they had the best leader, right? Jesus is your small group leader. That's pretty cool. Could you imagine you're getting ready for Tuesday night small group and Jesus is the leader? You're going to kind of, right? You're going to get ready. You're going to clean off. You're going to confess any, any sin that's hanging out there. You want to be, hey, Jesus, how you doing? Here's an amazing verse that we find. <clears throat> it says, for where two or three are gathered together in my name, Jesus is talking, I am there in their midst. I am there in their midst. Two or three. In other words, he goes, when, when you gather in a small group, he goes, I'm there helping you lead. I'm going to help you lead. Now, some of you have never been in a small group. And listen, if you're new to Christ, this is your next step. This is your next step in. Others of you, now listen to me, others of you have been a Christ follower for a while. Maybe you've come from another church. Maybe you've moved in from the area. We have that every July and August. We have a lot of transfer people who get moved in. Different reasons, for whatever reason. You, and you know you're a leader and you sense there's a call on your life to lead. And I want to tell you as your pastor, do whatever you need to do to meet the guidelines of leadership, which you, you discover in, in growth track, to be a small group leader. You need to be what God's called you to be. And some of you know it. And I'm just, you know, if that's, if that's God's hand on you, I'm just, would you pray about it and say, God, is that me? Am I supposed to be a small group leader? Now listen, we have some of you right here some of you are group leaders. You lead a group. And I want to say to you, I am proud of you. Thank you so much for leading a group. It's hard. I know it's no matter what your circumstances are, it's hard to lead a small group. You have to carve out some time. And most of us are very busy. Sometimes you might wonder, is it, am I spending my time wisely? Maybe you feel like you, you're not all that capable of it and you have inadequacy things. All the challenges that go into leading a small group, let me just say, you are changing lives because most of the life change that happens is being on belay. It's being just being there, doing life with people. And you're doing it, you're transforming lives. It's making a huge impact. You are not crazy. You're doing something that is going to impact people's lives and eternities. What I'd like to do is just take a moment. If you are a group leader, I would ask you, would you stand just a moment? I just want to honor you. If you're a group leader, all in the room, just stand right now. Okay? Thank you. Let's applaud. Thank you so much. You are amazing. You're not crazy. You're transforming lives. You're making a difference. Stay standing. Would you just remain standing? Thank you so much. You really are making a big difference regularly, in and out. This church is where it's at today because of you. Thank you very much. And 
what I'm going to, well, I'm closing the service, so you're, uh, that's why you might as well stay standing because you're going to leave. I, I need you to be there in front. They're going to go to their tables. They're going to be out in the cafe. They're going to be, I'm going to ask you to leave so that you can receive people. On your way out, I have, uh, I got a little carabiner for you, just to remind you, you, you don't want to climb with this, uh, but, but I want you to rem remember that this carabiner is like your, your group. It's like your group. I mean, you, you, you're tied together with other people. The group is like this carabiner, and it's making a difference. It's holding people up. It's keeping people, it's helping people summit and keeping some people from falling into a crevasse. So we'll see you in a few moments. You can go ahead and leave. I want to just lastly say that if you are not in a small group, this is the time to do it. Okay, this is our small group launch weekend. Everything starts over. And on our, uh, online, you can see small groups, and it has a whole list. You can meet. Go talk to some of them. And go hang out with them and say, hey, let me hear a little bit about your group. And then join a group this week or this month, preferably this week. They're all starting this week. And let me just warn you. You might go to a group, and you might go, hmm, I don't really fit there. These people are all EGRs. <laughs> and that's okay. Go to a different group. You, you have, that's what we do here. You don't, don't feel like, oh, gosh, I went to that group. Now I can't try. No, try different, try different ones until you land on one. You go, hey, I can connect here. This is a place. I connect with some of these people. I, like, you know, I can see myself doing life. And don't, I wouldn't be surprised if you meet some people today when you talk to them that in a year from now could be some of your best friends. God does that. And some of us really need that. If you're not in a small group, that's why we do it. It's not optional. We see it as this is the lifeblood of what Jesus started 2,000 years ago. And we want to just continue that on. Let's bow our heads and pray. Lord, I pray for those people who, some of you here, when I talked about being a leader, there was a little, something in your heart that said, maybe that's me. Would you just pray about it? I don't want to force you to do anything, but I am asking you, would you pray about it? If that's what God has for you, if God's calling you to help transform people's lives and change them, I pray for you. You are needed by the kingdom of God. That you would take the courageous step. Go through the steps. Go through growth track. Do whatever you need to do. I pray, Lord, for those here who are not in a small group. For whatever reason. Maybe it's fear. Or you don't know. Maybe you didn't know. Maybe you didn't know how important it was until today. So, Lord, I pray right now. Help us, Lord, to take that courageous step. Each one here. Lord, I pray for holy connections. That you would, you would connect with a leader that, or some people in a group. It wouldn't be forced. It wouldn't be difficult. Lord, I pray for your hand over this. Let your grace flow, Lord. I pray for everybody here, whatever need they have. Lord, let your power and your grace flow. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for listening to this week's message. We hope you enjoyed it. Don't hesitate to write us your story at amen at vineyardchurch.com. And we'll see you next week.